So uh, this is the text we're looking at for today. And we're looking at Isaiah chapter 26. No, 27. <laughs> Typo right here. It is It is 27. And... Um, Okay, so um, let me read. Let me read the first verse. Okay, we'll, we'll get get the first verse here. It says, "Bayom hahu yifkod Adonai becharbo hakasha hagadola vechazaka all liviatan nachash bariach." And so it says in that day the Lord with His uh, great and mighty sword. Okay. Um, it, it will be upon the the Leviathan, the Nachash, that is is fleeing. Okay, Bariach, and then it goes on. The all Leviathan Nachash Akalaton, and so that and upon the the Leviathan, the the Nachash, the serpent, the the coiling serpent, because of this word is um, this word right here is coiling. Um, uh, let me, um, yeah, coiling. Okay. And then it goes on and it says, uh, the, uh, the harag et hatanin asher bayam. Okay. So, and then uh, the, and he shall slay the dragon. He shall kill, right? Harag. He shall kill the, the dragon in, um, that is in the sea. Okay, and so um, this is where we get this idea of the dragon being both land-based and water-based, and or the serpent. So uh, I, Isaiah he re repeats this word, this this word. Uh, actually, I think I might have a typo in in there. It isn't. He isn't repeating the word tanin. Um, okay, here's more colors. Let me get let me get my yellow. Okay, so um, he isn't repeating this word tanin. Oh, and you know what? That's um a bad color. <laughs> he's he's uh he's repeating this word leviathan. Okay, and nachash leviathan nachash. And so, um, the idea of the leviathan the leviathan nachash is that they're you're coupling these two things together, just like the the ancient uh, Near Eastern religious texts are doing. Okay, and so we see. This connection that they could have gotten it from, from the, this the the ancient Israeli or Israel uh, understanding. Now, based upon the ancient Near East understanding of the serpent, Isaiah needed very strong imagery to illustrate his vision of God's victory over sin, oppression, and death. And we note that. Uh, we note that how the serpent is connected to sin, oppression, and death, according to the biblical narrative, according to the ancient Near East cultural narratives, you know, their religious beliefs. And the Leviathan story provides a much more profound imagery by using this language. And so uh, the next thing I want to look at is a text comparison on this, this one verse. And so I thought this was interesting. Um, you know, last week, for some reason... I was just looking here. <laughs> Last week, for some reason, this thing was the shifted off the screen. I don't know what it was doing because when I went and looked at the slide, it wasn't shifted off the screen. It was really weird. Um, OBS was doing something weird. Anyway, okay. So uh, let me let me read this. Let me read this here uh, first. The Septuagint it it writes it writes right here. It says, "On that day, God will bring the holy and great and mighty sword against the dragon, a fleet, a fleeing serpent against the dragon, a twisted serpent. He will slay the dragon." Okay. So the the Targum the Targum translation right here. Targum says, "At that time, the Lord shall punish with his great, mighty, and strong sword the king." Who has magnified himself as Pharaoh the first, and the king who has exalted himself as Sennacherib the second, and he shall slay the king that is strong as the dragon that is in the sea. Okay, so here we see that. Uh, okay, so here here we see 
that the Targum Jonathan translates the kings of Egypt and Babylon with the dragon of the sea. And this may have led to some of the commentators arguing about to whom the spirit is referring, uh, the, sorry, the serpent is referring to, you know, to Assyria or to Babylon or to Egypt. And uh, the Septuagint, it writes what we, what we had just read, that on that day God will bring the holy and great and mighty sword against the dragon, a fleeting serpent against the dragon, a twisted serpent, he will slay the dragon. And so... Here, the Greek tanin, or sorry, the 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 Hebrew, the Hebrew tanin. Let's see where are we at. Yeah, the the Hebrew text. Yeah, I got yellow. Um, the Hebrew Hebrew text tanin is translated as um draconta right here. Okay, and the the word draconta is related to ophin, which is serpent in Greek, and. In the Homeric writings, this is often the case, and the serpent often evokes fear from the sense of the creature being monstrous in size and power. And in the Septuagint, uh, dracon occurs 35 times, and it is first found with the meaning of snake. Okay, and you remember um, Jeremiah had taught, Rabbi Jeremiah had talked about this in the uh, Telegram channel that uh, concerning the Greek use of the word dracon and, and how it was first found to, to mean snake. And we read this in, in Exodus 7, verses 9 through 12, and, Deuter and it's, it's three times there. And in Deuteronomy 32, verse 33, as the rendering of tanin, okay? And the Hebrew word is also translated, is always translated using the word dracon, where it has this sense, okay? And in addition, dracon has was chosen to render various other Hebrew terms like Leviathan, like what we see, we see right, uh, right here, okay, and right here, okay. So you you look over here at the the Greek text, and you see, um, you see it here and and there, the one I underlined it, and then you see the the last one here, um, Tanin there, okay. So. As we, we have seen in the, the introduction part of the study tonight, that the ancient Near East myths describe the dragon or the serpent as a picture of prime evil power of chaos. Okay, and so this serpent is defeated at the hands of a god, which when fa then facilitated the world coming into being. Okay, and it may be possible that the authors of the Tanakh used this imagery to ascribe all power. Uh, to an authority of our God and Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, having power over all evil. You know, and, and the idea is that when the people lived in Canaan at that time, they knew what the Mesopotamian belief was. They knew what the Egyptian belief was. They knew what the Canaanite, ancient Canaanite belief was, you know, the Baal cycle and everything and the serpent. And so when they wrote of the glory and the power of God, they were writing to show that Hashem, the Lord God of Israel, is the Almighty God, and He has the authority and power over all of these things. Okay, and um, we're told according to the biblical text that monsters or dragons lived in the sea. And, and there are various examples like Job 7 verse 12 or Psalm 148 and Amos chapter 9. You know, check them out. You know, but the time when will come when God will destroy these, right, according to our verse right here in Isaiah 27, verse 1. And in addition to this, we also find the scriptural support for the Targum Jonathan translation that uh, in Isaiah 27, 1, when Ezekiel describes Pharaoh as a dragon and as an enemy of God's people. And we read this in Ezekiel chapter 29 and chapter 32. And we know now, now in the New Testament text, the word draco, dracon occurs 13 times and only in the book of Revelation where it's used extensively with reference to Hasatan, to the, the, that ancient deceiver, right? Uh, and it's used eight times in Revelation. And uh, I give references in the study. You can check it out on the website. But this description is made explicit in Revelation 12, verse 9 and 20, verse 2, where the word is used al along with the phrase, oh, ah. Oh, Office all Arxaios, that that ancient serpent, right? And this provides a direct connection back 
to the Genesis 3 account, okay, the, the term Diablos, the devil, right, in um, Satanas, you know, and, and that, that would be the, the Greek uh, transliteration for Hasatan, the, the deceiver, right? And we note that ultimately these things, they, they, they all work together in the biblical narrative to describe the sovereignty of God over the nations and even over the spiritual realm, and that he is victorious, and in him is redemption and truth. And we note what these things describe are that God is powerful, and for those who rebel against his word and his ways, there only remains his divine wrath for such people. And we also note that there are some eschatological aspects to Isaiah 27.1 here. And if we parallel this to the descriptions provided in the book of Revelation, you know, we can find these eschatological parallels. Now, Isaiah here in the opening of, of this chapter is expressing a divine truth that the Lord has great love and concern for his people. Those who have faith remain faithful to him. The wrath of God is to those who reject the Lord and his Messiah, Yeshua. And we note that there are many statements in the New Testament text that speak to this very thing. The God of the Tanakh is the same as the God in the New Testament text. You know, And, and what the Lord God was looking for in the Tanakh in the New Testament text is repentance, is humility, is faith and faithfulness. You know, having the the will to seek him rather than seeking one's own ways, right? And these things speak to those who remain faithful, will have a part in the garden of God, you know, also known as paradise, according to various descriptions that we read in the New Testament text. This kind of leads into verse 2. <laughs> of our of our reading and and three so we look here and it says in verse two it says bayom hahu kerem chemed anula okay and so in that day sing unto her the beautiful vineyard okay and it's interesting that the the, the king james translation actually says a a vineyard of red wine okay and uh, let me go on to, to verse 3, and then we will we'll begin continue discussion on, on verse 2 here. Oop. Um, okay, so verse 3, and it says, Ani Adonai notes, notes ra lir gaim ashkena pen uh, yif kod uh, alecha laila vayom et sarena. Okay, so that you know, I, the Lord, do keep it. I will water it every moment, moment, lest any hurt it. I will keep it night and day. Okay, and so Isaiah, he speaks to the the singing to the vineyard. Okay, and, and we find this anula. Okay, this is, this is the singing to her. Okay, and this, this vineyard is a plot of land that is used for growing grapes, you know, to make wine. And Israel's terrain was ideal for vineyards, which may account for their appearance throughout this biblical narrative in the poetic and the prophetic literature, like what we see here in Isaiah. And vineyards were important to the authors of the scriptures and are the setting for many biblical narratives. And the Torah includes several regulations related to vineyards, and I list those. I don't make it a point to uh, point them out besides citing the scriptures. And th their part, um, the vineyards were part of Israel's inheritance. And uh, vineyards are also a post-exilic sign of restoration, okay, the, re the blessing of God. And vineyards were seen as wise investments, which provided sustenance, sustenance to the owner. And God sometimes threatened to curse vineyards. Israel's rulers might demand taxation from the produce or even confiscate the vineyards. Like, remember, enable and uh, 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 Jezebel and um, Jezebel had Nabal killed. <laughs> and then Jezebel's husband, oh, I can't remember what his name is. I'm having a blank head. But um, anyway, yeah, that, that stealing of the vineyards so they can, they can take them. Okay. And in the Tanakh, vineyards provide imagery for poetry and wisdom literature and proverbs and, and, and parables and divine pronouncements that we read in Jeremiah and lament, laments and Ezekiel and analogies. 
and descriptions of deliverance like we see in Isaiah and messages of judgment. You know, uh, Jeremiah, Amos, and Zephaniah, prophets prophesied. And Yeshua, he also continued this tradition using vineyards in many of his parables. And so we, we note how the text literally states, okay, it literally states, it says, it says, in that day, okay, and and it's in he, right? The the carom, the vineyard Hamed, the beautiful vineyard, and sing to her, right? Okay, so it literally says that. And I don't know, I don't know why the King James writes red wine here, but um in Isaiah 27 3, we're told that the Lord Himself will keep the vineyard, He will water it and keep it day and night. And we know that there is something very special about this vineyard that the Lord God has pays particular attention to. It's interesting how um that uh that this is happening now. Um when we look at the text comparison for these verses, we see the following. Okay, so now the the Targum translation here. It says, it says the following. It says, At that time, the congregation of Israel, which is like a vineyard planted in a goodly land, shall sing concerning that vineyard. The Lord keep the covenant of her fathers with them, that I may not destroy them. But at the time that they provoked me to anger, I gave them the cup of their punishment to drink. But their sins were the cause of their punishment. Nevertheless, my word shall protect them by day and by night. Okay, we note how... The Targum Jonathan adds a, a few things to draw out important points concerning sin and punishment. In addition, we're told that the Word of God protects and how the Word protects is founded in its application to our lives. You know, and the interesting thing is that when, when we think about this, we're reminded of, of Jewish prayer. And I'm reminded of Jewish prayer, like the Shachrit service in the morning prayers. And uh, it goes, a lot of them go, they, they begin by, um, it says, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Ech. No, sorry. Um, Baruch. Okay, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu um, um, Melech Olam. Okay, I think Melech Olam. You know, bless you, Lord God, um, King of the Universe. And it Asher Kidshanu B'mitzvotav. Okay, that sanctifies us in the commandments okay so um it's um baruch ata adonai melecha olam asher kidshanu b'mitzvotav okay that blessed are you lord god king of the universe who sanctifies in the commandments and there are a number of prayers that that begin with this and the reason this is so significant you know when as believers we we know that yeshua has sanctified us in heaven Right, and he is his. Uh, he made us righteous before our Father in heaven, and so the the concept is, is as it is in heaven, so it shall be here on earth. So, how do we live sanctified lives? Right, the way we live our sanctified lives is to live our lives for the Lord. This is this sets us apart. This separates us unto the Lord. Right, and this is what this Jewish prayer means that he asher kidshanu the mitzvotav that he sanctifies us in the commandments, right? The, the, the commandments are meant to separate us from the world so that we live for the Lord. We bring glory to his name. We bear his testimonies. And, and this, this is where we find the protective feature of the word of God in our lives. It's found in its application for our lives. And the Septuagint, now the Septuagint translates this in the following way. Said, in the following way, it says, "On that day, beautiful vineyard, O oh, desire to begin with it, and I am a fortified city, a besieged city. I will water it pointlessly, for it will be captured by night and by day, and the way the wall will fall." Okay, so that, that's significantly different, right? And we note that both the the Targum translation and the Septuagint. Do not mention red wine, or like the King James translation does. You know, so here um, we're going to look at why this might be. Okay, and the Septuagint writes about the futility of the care for the vineyard, since it will be captured because of the unfaithfulness of the people. Okay, so the vineyard represents people, right? And um, from a Torah perspective, according to Genesis nine verses twenty to twenty one, Noah was a man of the soil, right? He planted a vineyard and then he got drunk, 
right? And he uncovered himself in his tent. And then you, you see that that episode with his sons. Um, the the Torah describes the twin themes of the vine and wine as symbols of fertility and well-being on the one hand and of wine as causing debauchery and shame on the other you know this is what we've been we've been looking at we'll, we'll see more of that in chapter 28 in in the coming weeks okay and the vine was an important part of da- Israel's daily life as well as that of the tabernacle and even Yeshua and his disciples Use the vine analogy for abiding in the Lord or having a part with the Messiah. Okay, and so as with other crops, the owner was not permitted to reap the vineyard twice in one harvest. Gleanings were to be left for those who lacked possessions. We we see the Torah command on on the vineyard. And vineyards were to lie fallow every seventh year during the Shemitah, and they were not to be sown with other plants. And in Isaiah 5, verses 1 through 7, we find a picture of Israel as the vineyard and God as the vine dresser and a harvest of wild grapes instead of a ripe and juicy grapes from which to make wine. And, and the, the symbolism of this passage is found also in other prophetic books and in the Psalms. And Isaiah is a, is a vine brought out of Egypt that fills the land. And the psalmist asked why God has allowed it to be ravaged in Psalm chapter 80. And, or sorry, Yeah, chapter 80, okay. (laughs) And although Israel was a choice vine, we're told that it became a wild vine in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 21, due to her sins, okay? And so we know something about keeping grapes, that in order to have a plentiful harvest, the owner must prune and trim back the plant to maximize growth of the fruit. The analogy is to that of God our Father being the vine dresser, the owner, and so his hand is always at work in our lives to cause us to have a greater fruit production for his glory, right? So here again, we see this idea of the Lord working in our lives. This is something that each and every one of us should be observing in our lives. If we do not see or know that God is working in, in your life, you know, this this is a, this should be a daily thing. Is God working in your life, right? And um, then if, if, you, we, if we don't see that, then it's time for a re-examination of our faith and our purpose. You know, what what do I truly believe? You know, if I'm not seeing God work in my life, am I seeking that? Am I am I do I want the Lord in my life? Do I have his spirit dwelling within? You know, and these are good questions. Now, when we get to the text here on um Isaiah 27, verse verse 2. Uh, uh, regarding the vineyard, okay, that, that it's interesting here is the the word chemed, okay, and there there is a um, this word this word isn't written. See, it's written with a chet, a mem, okay, and a dalet. You know, it's not it's not written with a chet, a, a mem, and a resh, okay, and if it is Hamer, that means wine, okay? And so it's possible that the King James translators looked at this word and saw in their mind Hamer as opposed to Hamed, which means pleasant. And we note something that when we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see this very thing taking place. And I found this the 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 Dead Sea uh the Dead Sea Scroll one Q Isaiah A and well you can see right here um Homer or Hemer and instead of Hamed you know with a Dalet okay and so this this kind of agrees with what the King James had to translate and it very well could be a scribal error you know that is highly likely what's going on here. But um, regardless of how this verse is translated or whether there is some kind of scribal error or not, right? This, this song indicates how God's people, the redeemed, sing of God's triumph over the corrupt earth, right? Over this corrupt world. And we also note that Hashem also sings to his beloved, right? And we note that the emphasis upon the vine throughout the scriptures, they emphasize how God's people, their keeper, is the Lord our Father, God our Father in heaven himself. Yeshua used this truth when he taught according to John chapter 10, 
verses 11 13. And we're told that the Lord does not abandon his people to their enemies, but is their watchman both day and night. Okay. So um, the next verse we're looking at is verse 4. Okay. So it says, Chema ain li. That is significant right there. There's first three words. We'll talk about that. Okay. So Chema ain li. Mi yitneni shamir shayit b'milchama ef sa'a b'va atzitana yachad. Okay. So the verse, this verse begins with, and it says, uh, Chema ain li. Okay. So this, it says, I do not have anger. Okay. And this is, this is significant. Speaking of God, right? And the Lord is character, right? This is, expresses, expresses his character. You know, that what he does is not based upon an emotional moment. You know, the reminder, or sorry, the remainder of the verse speaks to the actions that are taken when briars and thorns are found in battle and how the Lord deals with these to burn them up, right? And it, it says, it says, the whole translation of the verse is, fury or anger is not in me. How, who would set the briars and thorns against me in battle? I would go through them. I will burn them together. Yachad, right? Together. And so uh, this verse speaks to the actions that are taken when briars and thorns are found in, in, in battle. And the key concept here is not being is not to be a briar or a thorn. We're not to be briars or thorns, right? We're to be fruit, right? And note the Hebrew text writes uh, shamir shayit, right? Briars and weeds, right here. Shamir shayit, and the thorn described here is in a general sense, which designates several species. And this has its parallel to man, to woman, or to child of a rebellious nature and is a thorn or a weed in the midst of God's people. And we note what Yeshua said when he alluded to the low quality fruit of the thorn when he asks, are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? When he, he taught in Matthew chapter 7 and Luke chapter 6. Okay, and we also note the Torah perspective according to Genesis 3 verses 17 to 18 that God curses the ground declaring that it would bear thorns and thistles. And it is because of this that farmers constantly battle thorns and weeds which grow readily on untended land. Okay, and Yeshua used this imagery in the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4. And the prophets used thorns and briars as symbols of the desolation of the land and the people. You know, thorns were used as hedges and instruments of torture, right? Remember, they did with Yeshua and putting a crown of thorns on his head. You know, they're, they were highly flammable and were cleared by burning, right? And they were used in hearth fires and, and such. Okay. Now, the last two verses is verse 5 and verse 6. Okay. So, it says, O Yahazek, Bemauzi ya ase shalom li ya um shalom ya ase li okay so or let him take hold of my my fortress right my stronghold this is this meuz is a, a a very like a mountain fortress a strong fortress so let him take hold of my fortress that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me okay and then it goes habayim uh, ya Yashresh, Yaakov, Yatsitz, U Farach, Yisrael, Umalu, Kane Tevel, Tevel, Tanuva. Uh, okay, so that he shall cause them that, that come to Jay, uh, Jacob to take root. Israel will blossom and bud and fill the face of the earth with, um, with Tevel, with, uh, with fruit. Okay, so we note how the imperfect tenses that are generated that are repeated here and i thought this was really interesting um that uh, we see 
repeated here is um, yase, right? This this word yase uh, right here, right here, and um, let me let me change my color. Okay, this word yase and yase here. Okay, so um, these these are imperative tenses that are repeated, and it's a reference to something that is going to be accomplished but has not yet occurred, like peace. And how one's actions to or or taking hold of the stronghold of God only when this happens, this is accomplished. You know, so this this speaks to our taking refuge in the Lord and of the Lord God being the one who protects us and is the one in whom we trust. We note how this speaks to the character of God that He is merciful, He's caring, that He's loving, and how He is committed to the relentless destruction of His enemies. And uh, but would rather be reconciled to his enemies so that they would be enemies no more, right? And we note that how Paul uses this concept according to Colossians chapter 1, verses 18 to 23. So here he says the following. He says in Colossians uh, chapter 1, 18 to 23, and it says, And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it is it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell, and having made peace, peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now, now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Okay, so <clears throat> Paul writes <clears throat> Paul writes that we were alienated and enemies. And it was because of Yeshua that his blood and his blood that reconciled us with God. Okay, so the Lord God, um, that that was uh, that was right here. I was underline that. I think it'd be important to underline it. And okay, and so the Lord God gives His Holy Spirit to dwell within those who believe in Yeshua, and then that subsequently transforms their lives. So as Isaiah is saying here, he says he says here in the in his text, oh would it take hold of my mountain stronghold. Okay, so we're we're, we're looking right here. Oh Yahazek Bemauzi. Okay, so um Bemauzi, right, my stronghold. This is what takes place for those who believe in Yeshua, right? We we are taking hold of that mountain stronghold. We're finding refuge, right? And the, these things show the completing of this idea of the Lord God not being committed to destruction, but to love and mercy and peace and redemption and restoration, right? And in fact, Isaiah speaks to God providing the refuge for his people. According to the New Testament text, he did exactly that in Yeshua, the Messiah. Okay, now in verse 6, we read, <clears throat> that he shall cause them that come to Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the earth with fruit. You know, and it's very interesting how the word for fruit is not your standard word, you know, tenuva, right? It's not your standard word for fruit, okay, in Hebrew, which is peri, right? And when we look at the text comparison of the Septuagint, the Masoretic text of Targum, you know, we see the following. So um, we look at <clears throat> we look at that here. So in the the LES translation of the Septuagint, it says, "Those who dwell in it will cry out, let us make peace, and those who those come uh, those who come are children of Jacob. Israel will sprout and bloom, and the inhabited world will be filled with his fruit." Okay, and the word for fruit is. Um, is right here. It is um, carpo. Carpo. Okay, and then we got the Hebrew equivalent here. Um, this word, um, karpna, karpos, it, it occurs 125 times in the Septuagint. 
And it's usually for the verb um, peri, for fruit, which refers to the fruit produced by trees and or by wine. And, but it is not applied to grain or crops generally. And the word is commonly used for offspring, such as the fruit of the womb. We'll read that in Genesis chapter 30, verse 2, and Micah 6, verse 7. And it can be used figuratively in the sense of result. In the Proverbs chapter 1, verse 31, in, in Amos, Philo, he uses karpos about 270 times, though Usually the sense is literal. We find a variety of figurative applications, just as plants, when irrigated, bear fruit, so does the soul when watered with wisdom. Okay, and that was something from Philo. And when virtues are implanted in the mind, they bring forth the most advantageous fruit, good and praiseworthy deeds. Okay, and in the New Testament text, the noun um, karpos occurs more than two times. And the adjective um, akarpos, unfruitful, is found one time. And the verb um, karpophoreo, uh, to bear fruit, occurs one time. And its cognate adjective for fruit bearing is only once. And so uh, it's very infrequent here. And it should be noted that to express the idea of bearing fruit, John prefers the expression of karnon, ferein. Okay. And the, the synoptics often use carpon, uh, paeon, paeon, okay, like in Matthew 3, 8. Now, the interesting aspect about all of this is, is to the fruit that one bears due to having joined themselves with God in heaven, right? And, and this is what we're, what we're seeing here in the, in the text by taking hold of that mountain stronghold, who is the Lord, right? And, that's that's this idea of joining oneself with God in heaven and how Israeli sanct Israel sanct um, centric this these descriptions are right and God He is the keeper of His people and in the last days He will supply our needs and turn our enemies away from us you know from both Isaiah's perspective and the New Testament perspective the children of Jacob right the the Tekna of Yaakov uh, includes both Jew and Gentile alike and those who walk according to their faith, and remain faithful to the Lord. Now, all of these things provide a significant context to the New Testament text and the events that we read taking place in the New Testament text in regard to Yeshua the Messiah. And this is all the more reason why we should take our faith very seriously and believe who Yeshua is and what he has done on our behalf. Okay. <clears throat>